and we're recording. All right. Let's settle in here and do a little bit of talking about LARPing, armor, and sort of setting the bar of fashion at LARP with regard to what you're building for yourself, uh, as well as how you're increasing the value you add to the game when you invest in yourself and your kit. Now, before I can really get started here, I guess one of the things I have to do is sort of define where is the scope of what I'm talking about. LARP is a big umbrella, a lot of things fit under it. You could say that LARP ranges anywhere from ancient antiquity to complete historical fiction to non-historical fiction to modern World War II military reenactments. Uh, for the purposes of what I'm talking about, as we can kind of see here, I'm really talking about more fantasy, medieval-style LARPing. And for the purposes of this discussion, I feel it really only applies to games that are going to have a, if you wanted a real-world frame of reference, a time period from antiquity to sort of a pre-gunpowder era, call it 14, maybe 1500s. Though I could see a lot of this also applying to games which would be in the post-gunpowder era, maybe not so much in the armor, but in terms of aesthetics, with that sort of period, all the way up, right up until the start of the 20th century there, really the early 1900s, because military fashion was still pretty exciting up to then. Uh, as other people have commented in the past, if you wanted to know what Napoleon's cavalry looked like, you can find pictures of French cavalry going into that first year of World War I in 1914 with breastplates and bright red pants uh, going off to fight the first mechanized war, which unfortunately was not what you should have been wearing. Now, the premise of this, as you can tell by the title, is, is that you know the, the boots make the player, but NPCs set the fashion. And what does that mean? When you go to a lot of LARPs, particularly in North America, you'll find NPCs who are being sent out in these very flat roles. They're not persistent. They just sort of go out, do your thing, and come back. You know, Maybe do that thing a couple of times. Here's some treasure. Repeat it, rinse, come back. And if a player tries to engage them, they're getting this very flat, sort of cardboard cutout experience of what is this NPC's motivation? Well. You know, I'm, I'm here to kill you. I'm an orc, I'm marauding. That's what I do, I'm an orc, I maraud, and I really don't have anything planned out beyond that. Because they weren't given anything for it. And they're dressed accordingly. You know, when you send someone out to be disposable, they are sent out looking disposable. And that means you get the orc who's in a green tabard, sort of moon face, green face paint. You know, someone really dedicated might do their whole neck. And you get a couple of chevrons or some symbol different color face paint and it's not very immersive and it doesn't make for a good experience but it's sort of what people have come to accept as a normal experience and now some of us are trying to change that some games are really stepping up how their NPCs work even large franchise games are really tying into this because we've seen so many good examples so NPCs set the fashion when your NPCs look better, suddenly players start looking better. This is true of everything to do with Monster Camp, though, and the game, the NPCs. When the NPCs are dressed to the nines, suddenly players start dressing better. When the combat NPCs are now even dressing up and they're wearing full suits of armor. And I don't just mean the one special guy who's the boss. I mean, everybody has, like, some kind of armor on and they're wearing tunics and they actually have you know good looking kits and whatnot they're not using some ratty donated piece of pvc plumbing that's a half an inch too big and weighs four pounds they actually have good possibly even better weapons than the players do now in terms of aesthetics that depends on the larp here at some point boffer weapons unfortunately all start to kind of look the same to a degree and you wind up with that basic sort of sclub. You know, it's the rounded sword. It's the sword club, the sclub. Which maybe it has a handle and maybe it doesn't and it's a mace. But it, it becomes very difficult to make meaning 
meaningful differences in terms of the topography of that weapon. When you start getting into the latex and the plastidip weapons, suddenly a whole new world opens up and there's a real variety. Of course, the price also goes up commensurately, and price will be discussed in this because that's definitely within the scope of what we're talking about. Now, for an MPC to set the fashion, though, they need to actually really be defined and I think to an extent uh, the, the notion of the sandbox and persistence begins to play a large part in that. One of the main LARPs I've gotten involved with recently where I am been playing both an in-town and, and, and what they call an antagonist role has all the NPCs as persistent. And persistence really means in this case that that NPC is going to be available in the world somewhere. That's the role you're playing for the whole weekend. When I go out as an orc, my orc has a name. My orc has built up relationships, positive and negative, with players, with other NPCs, and they are a known quality. In many regards, you'd almost want to treat them like another player. If I'm going out as my town NPC, this is something which is not really combat-oriented, though it could get involved in it, which is there more to act as a resource for players, uh, both in terms of generating role play, generating conversation and encounters, helping forward plot, helping just forward interactions in the game, and creating and fostering this environment where people will have these more enriching experiences. So if I have a character that's not combat oriented, why did I build a suit of armor for? because it was in the nature of the character. Now, if you have a LARP where your NPCs are treated as disposable, I'd really entreat you just once, for maybe a weekend, just to see what happens if you can convince your, your GMs to say, hey, can we make all of our NPCs persistent for the weekend? Let's actually give them names. Let's give them motivations. Let's actually give them, make them pick for their permanent death if your game uses permanent death. You know, give them a point to resurrect at somewhere that we're going to hide away, and you know, maybe part of the point of the weekend is to find out where they're coming from, rather than just throwing them out there and they die and they come back and they die and they come back. When you know the motivations of an NPC, it's like motivating for a PC. Suddenly, you can actually start building for it, and when you show up looking dressed up like a player, players respond to it. In a number of ways. Some in-game, some out-of-game. In-game, they go, oh, this person looks important. You've heard the, no the notion of the suit makes the man. Well, the costume makes the character, which is really a big part of this. And when you start doing that, suddenly you find you have a much more dedicated NPC. They've invested themselves into the role a lot more deeply. Suddenly they'll start looking for, well, what's the lore? What do I want to do this for? Where is my motivation for wanting to do these things? Should I interact? Am I allowed to interact? Oh, I should be talking to players as well? Can they convince me to change size? Can we have double crosses? This all becomes possible with persistence. Now, in terms of building, there's an associated cost. And in terms of investment, there's many levels. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of this funny story that uh, a friend of mine related to me once who has been involved in the running of many, many LARPs. Uh, he's been involved in running national games that have franchises, being been involved in games with single chapters. He has traveled all over America, Canada, and Europe. It, it's, it's his big passion. But he related this story to me about how when he was in Germany, you know, one of the German LARPers commented on how pleased he was to see the level of kit that he had put together because the general opinion is that Americans, by and large, are not very invested in their characters because we're buying these sort of mass-produced, not really well-made kind of outfits, and you know, we all have these slubs, and it, it doesn't look very good, we're not invested in it, we look a little disposable. But at the same time, the same German related, that all the Norwegians look that way at the Germans. Because the Norwegians are sitting there going, well, it's nice that you have that, you know, pseudo army build, but you didn't build your own boots. 
you know, you didn't actually go out and get leather and mold it to yourself, and you're not really invested deeply in your character enough. You haven't made your own shoes. And for a long time, that was the status quo. But there's been a real shift in the last couple of years where now we have an unprecedented level of quality materials and instruction available to us, not just because of the internet, though I can't understate the internet's importance. It's, it's impossible to understate that or overstate that, I should say. But because now there are people who are making small industries of creating the components to build what you want. And I've got some examples of that here and some of what goes into that. So where does that leave an NPC who wants to invest in their character? So in my case, for the first two events I had to go to, I, I was told I was going to be playing this Rune Master. And the Rune Master would be teaching the Rune Warriors who needed a, an in-game town resource who would be their instructor. I had to do this. And I didn't know anything about the game. I didn't know anything about how it had gone. I was coming into this sort of in media res. It had three or four events, and then someone had to drop out because, you know, they weren't available anymore. And my friends, you know, the same friend who told me that story from Germany, Dan Comstock, who was a hilarious individual, said, hey, we need you to step into this if you're available. We think you'd do good at it. And they explained persistence, and they explained this. And said, well, so basically it's this sort of somewhere between holy man, warrior sort of thing for these guys who harvest runes and do all this stuff. And I went, all right, so he's somewhere between a Viking and a Jedi. Hmm. So I said, all right, let's go and make something cool. And part of the class was that they had to have the, the runes for the things they were going to do to empower them. So I made this. And it's tough to see a little bit, but you can sort of see the inlay patterns and the copper and bronze and the brass and the steel and the aluminum. There's all these runes laid into it, and that was a big effort. And it was an expensive effort. That was four months of work and approximately 500 ish dollars of my own money thrown into that. And that's an extreme. I did that purely out of basis of saying I hadn't been doing this in a while, and I went a little crazy, and I said, let's go and do something extra special. So you wind up with this... 25 pound suit of exotic metals and it looks amazing and we got a lot of great feedback on it but it cost a lot of money and it took a lot of time and maybe you don't have that much money at that time I can guarantee you though if you wanted to buy something like this though it would cost an order of magnitude more uh, several of my friends and, you know, who are in the theater my wife is a professional for costume technology and I said, man, you know, I spent this much money, this much time on it. I don't even know. I mean, what, if someone asked to buy that, what would I sell it for? And they didn't bat an eye. They said, you should sell that for less than $3,000. And I was blown away. They said, no, that's handcrafted. You've made this entire thing. It's custom made. It's very unique. It, does, it isn't like a boring sort of uniform pattern. And I realized they're right. Your money is worth your time. So in terms of what it's worth, though, it's incalculable because it's very custom, it's made for me, and I'm able to invest myself into this character, and it really brought the character out of me, which is really the point. Suddenly I'm there, and you're this Viking sort of person with all these runes all over you, and the sunlight hits the armor, and you can see the copper and the brass, and the players reacted incredibly to it, to the point where halfway through the event, we this didn't even get between events, players were looking for ways to modify their armor. Be like, oh, I want to be like the Rune Master. He has shown us this really cool thing, and we want to do that too. So they were like carving runes into their armor, getting strips of leather, and someone had a wood burner, and they were burning runes into that, attaching these strips of leather, and talking about doing chain mail inlays. The ability to invest this leads other people to invest in themselves. So NPCs really set the fashion in that regard. And this is a non-combat NPC. This is really, it looks good. It works as armor. It's very protective as armor, actually. Uh, but it, it's just there for aesthetic purposes. Now, of course, the one thing to be said is like, well, that's really heavy. 
25 pounds, that's a heavy suit of armor, especially for a LARP where you could be wearing it for 24, 48 hours. Potentially the whole weekend, really. I, I mean, you're going to sleep at some point, but the minute you wake up, it's probably going back on. But how many hours of inspiration did that provide? You know, it, it, it's like compound interest. Now all of a sudden you've got people investing in their own armor and their own kits and modifying things and building stuff. And I'm getting all these emails and it's really cool. It, 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 it really inspires people. So, I've transitioned now subsequently to a combat role. And they said, well, you know, we're, we're going to we need you to do this, and you're going to be heading up this faction, which is going to be very combat-oriented, very antagonistic, and you're going to be doing this thing. So I made this. Now, this, I don't know if you can tell, but this is all plastic. It doesn't really look like it, it, which is one of the reasons I really like it. And I'm going to put links up to where I get all the parts for all these things. But you get the plastic, and the plastic, surprisingly enough, can look really cool. It, it doesn't have that flat look. It doesn't have a matte look to it. It actually has some texture and some vitality. It's like a pewter and a copper that I mixed together on that, and I added in, I don't know if you can see here if I do this, just these strips of leather hang out the front to give it a bit more of a savage look to it. And I said, well, I need to have a pouch all the time, so I attached a pouch to the armor. and It's all there, and there's lots of little details to it. The difference between making this and this, though, so this would be considered lamellar armor, and it's very popular, uh, especially in the SCA. It's very easy to build, it's very quick to build, it doesn't require a lot of knowledge. This requires a lot of experimentation, because at some point, if you're dealing with chain mail or scale mail, they functionally build the same way. It's If you ever look it up, you're going to find this thing called a European 4-in-1 pattern. And that just means that for every center ring, four rings go into it, functionally. They both work the exact same way when you look at them from the back. There's no difference in how it goes, but when you want to go and change it to get the fitting right, you've got to learn how to do what they call expansions and contractions. And there's lots of tutorials on it. I'm not going to go into the details of that. That's a little too granular. But they can be found everywhere. So you can find that all over. Lamellar is a lot simpler. There are no expansions and contractions. It's just measure out what you need, go that far, great, and then you start lacing it. And the lacing pattern, unless you get into the sort of more ornate Japanese lacing patterns, usually is pretty self-evident depending on the type of plate you get. And in terms of plate variety, there's a lot out there. Uh, there's one place I found in the United States that does the plastics uh, in this sort of textured Wisby D plate. They also have a flat sort of uh, tombstone style plate. They have a larger tombstone style plate and they're very good. Very reasonably priced. And if this cost $500 of many different types of metals and exotics and whatnot, so I say exotics, but basically anything that isn't aluminum is functionally, aluminum or steel is an exotic metal. So copper, brass, things of that nature. Uh, nickel, there's nickel plates in this. Exotic metals. If you were keeping it in aluminum, it would have been a little bit lighter. Uh, but you still have to go and do all this work of individually hooking them together. So there's hundreds of scales and thousands of rings hooking it all together. This takes a lot less effort. This took four months. This took about uh, 25 hours. One of our NPCs, we had her come over buy all her parts, and three of us worked on it. We had her entire breastplate done in five hours with three people working on it. So 15 man hours total, but actual labor with three people working on it was condensed down to five. A full chest and shoulders, five hours. That's tough to beat. Uh, the other nice thing about the plastic is, of course, this suit weighs 25 pounds, this suit weighs five. The suit doesn't rot, doesn't smell bad, you can throw a hose on it and it's clean again. There's really you've got paracord, which is nylon, lacing it all together. And there's some leather bits on here that I had as flourishes, but you don't need them. They're 100% optional. But it looks really good. And it sells what we're trying to do here. You can see how the colors start to match up when we start doing inlays and weird things and all these very earthy tones and the blacks and whites. You can really sell 
character for it. And if you didn't want to use plastics, there's lots of places where you can get metal. There's at least a, a, a few on Etsy I know which are doing the exact same types of plates as this, but in aluminum and in steel. And if you want to get even more exotic, there's a few SCA vendors who are doing extremely exotic scale types. If you want to have, you know, Vietnamese or Parthian style scales, there's someone out there selling them as blanks. And that sort of goes back to my earlier comment about how we're in an era of incredible resources. And I guess let me touch on that for a moment, because when we're talking about resources, we kind of need to know where to look. And I'm going to put links to a lot of these, I should say all of these that I can get in here, at the bottom of the video. And the big ones are that where do you get the materials? So metalworking stuff, uh, the, the you know, I think at this point most of us have run into the Ring Award, the ringlord.org, and they are pretty much the supplier of rings and scales for metal on the internet. They, they've been the best for over a generation, at least 20 some odd years that I've been aware of them, possibly longer at this stage. And they have an incredible variety and good pricing for what it is. Considering the fact that they're the only source of it, it's not like they're gouging anybody. They still have bulk pricing rates, which is great. Building one of these in plastic versus building one of these, the parts for this, for a full suit, you can get it together for under $100. Depending on how big you are. Obviously, if, you, if you're taller or wider or what have you, it takes more. But I'm you know, five foot eleven, six feet tall, somewhere in that range, and 190 pounds, about 100, 110 dollars, and that's with power cord and the plates. Now, obviously, if you want to get the leather, that's more, but 100 bucks, all right, that's not so bad. 15 hours, just to go and put it together, and that's basically two hours a night for a little over a week. That's not so bad at all, and weighs five pounds, you can put your MPCs in these. Suddenly you can have an actual MPC shack where everyone's coming out in these really nice lamellar suits. And if you wanted to have big shiny suits, you could do that too. But you'll have these suits that are cleaner friendly. They're easy to do. You can just spray them down with Febreze if you want. Wipe them off. They're not going to tire your MPCs out. They don't weigh anything. And I know there's a lot of people who like chainmail. And chainmail is... It, it, it's one of these things where I, I feel that sometimes people let the armor become the costume, and Shane very guilty of that. You see a lot of, it, at some point you'll turn around and go, wow, there's a whole lot of guys running around out here in metal miniskirts. And Shane can look good when it's done right. And a lot of the sources of prefab Shane are not doing it particularly well. There's a lot of butted mail, which is to say just rings that aren't anything but you take a ring, you bend it, put it together, and that's, just, that's called a butted link. You just butt the two ends of the ring together, and that's it. And there's a lot of this coming out of places like India where it's made very quick, and it's not made particularly well, it's not made out of particularly good components, sometimes unhealthy components, especially if it's steel has been treated with zinc. That can get ugly. You wind up investing a lot of money, you know, two or three hundred dollars on something, which starts to fall apart and starts to rust very quickly. So, I, I'm not always the biggest fan of chainmail. Aluminum chainmail can look good, but it has that weird, oddly bright color to it sometimes. Unless you're looking for that, that's great. I feel chainmail is something which should be a layer. You know, you wear it under something. Maybe you put like just a simple sort of thing over it, or some kind of tunic. Or if you go back and watch. Lord of the Rings, uh, specifically the second movie, you'll see a lot of chainmail in that movie, but no one is just hanging out in like a chain shirt except for like a couple of the peasants. You know, Aragorn puts on his big chainmail Bernie and then he throws his leather duster with some layers on over it and some other things, you know. Chainmail looks great when you add some other things to it. If you just let chainmail be your costume, very flat. And I feel avoiding that flatness is a big part of what we really are talking about here. Now, 
we're talking about MPC setting the fashion, and I, I mentioned, it's, of course, it's in the title I mentioned before, boots make the PC. And this has to go back to that point of what's the investment level. So now you're a player, and you're seeing this coming at you and saying, wow, these guys are really investing in their characters. They really enjoy it. They are having so much fun, and it's infectious, and you want to look good, too. And Boy, how can I do that? So the first thing is that when I say boots make the PC, it's because usually footwear is one of those places where you really have to want it to invest in it. A lot of people can say, well, you know, you'll just, it's your, you know, you haven't been LARPing very long, just just get a simple tabard and maybe some sort of black sweatpants. And you, you can fake it till you make it. You know, maybe you'll buy something from museum replicas. And you can have you know, the Robin of Loxley jerkin with your thing. That, that'll be good enough for now. But it really isn't. It, it's just one of those things where you turn around and you'll see that person and they're jarring. It, it's like seeing someone who shows up with motocross gear to the fantasy lark that they've spray painted black and go, look, I'm wearing armor. It's very jarring. It's not something you really want to see. If you see the person who shows up in blue jeans, you, you know, everybody will be like, no, that's not right. You can't wear blue jeans here. This is not a blue jeans era. You know, go to the zombie lark that's set in 2015, you're allowed to have blue jeans there. It's cool. In fact, rip them up a little bit. It'll be even better. But for the fantasy LARP, you really don't want to see someone in blue jeans. You know, you don't want to look down and, and see cargo shorts and cleats. Though I know that that, that does happen. So what happens there then? So suddenly you can really start determining who's really invested in their character because they've invested in footwear. Or, look, let's put this another way. When you're running across the field and you start having to interact with somebody, you know, like, um, you know, hello, hello, hail, you notice the shoes they're wearing. And this happens in real life, too. If you go on job interviews, suddenly, especially for men and women, the, the shoes you wear are very impactful to the interview. It makes a distinct impression. If you show up in a pair of wing tips or something serious, then you know, you're treated seriously. If you show up in a pair of Nikes in a two-piece blue suit for your interview, they're probably not going to take you very seriously. In fact, they probably won't hire you on the basis of your shoes. If they do hire you, they're going to look at you kind of weird, and you might not even get as good of a rate for your salary because of shoes, of all things. Now, this may sound a little weird. It may sound a little pretentious, but it's very true. So suddenly you have to be very conscientious of that. Now, if you're there and, you know, Lord so-and-so is there, the town sheriff, and you're walking across the field to greet them, and which person who is the lord of the village do you take more seriously? You know, the person who's in a pair of Nikes? I don't know. That, that, you can tell that across the field. Maybe you get up close and you see they're wearing, oh, wearing these, sort of a standard shoe. Oh, it's got a brand on it. Oh, I don't like that very much. So where's the sort of safe middle ground? Classic combat boot. It's very modern looking, but there's a lot to be said for the combat boot. And, and you can champion the combat boot quite a bit. And this one in particular is not necessarily the best example, even though it's uh, very sturdy. The combat boot has a lot to be said for it. I mean, first and foremost, you can get them cheap. They may not be the best boots in the world, but you can find them for 20 bucks. If you go online and look, uh, you can find jungle boots or any sort of combat boot, generally starting at around 20 to $25. If you go to a Goodwill, you can find combat boots for 20 to $25. And then it just goes up from there, all up to like, you know, $200 for a very, very good pair of, say, heavy leather Corsair jump boots or something. And there's all manner of styles and whatnot, but the, the things you can champion about the combat boot are, one, it has a good tread on it, so you're not going to be sliding everywhere. I know a lot of people for their sort of initial boots, and, and sometimes they're mocked as role-play boots, which I, I don't like that term because I don't feel that anything that enhances 
endgame immersion or roleplay should be belittled, but the quality of these is not so great as you'll see people getting those mini tonks, sort of the knee-high ones that were always in the museum replicas catalog, and now they're almost fashionable. You'll see like a lot of girls wearing them with leggings and whatnot, uh, and they have they come usually in black or brown, sort of a tan with fringe on them, and they're basically just knee-high moccasins. There's not they're not an exciting moccasin. It's a very bare bones kind of boot, but they were always relatively inexpensive, you know, generally fifty to seventy-five dollars. Which, in terms of footwear, particularly not normal footwear, is not unreasonable for a knee-high boot. It's not unreasonable, believe it or not. But they had a flat sole. They were not necessarily very stable. They had no ankle support. Combat boots have that shredded sole that's going to have no problems in wet grass and mud. It has a reinforced ankle shank, so you know. You're not going to roll your ankle when you're running around in the woods at night. There's a lot of good things to be said for it. And generally, you know, you can get them in black. So suddenly it becomes this default, oh, well, there you go, I can get away with that. No one's really going to notice it. If everyone else is wearing combat boots, why would anyone notice if I'm wearing combat boots? So may as well. But what if you want to really invest in something a little special? Then you start getting into saying, I want a custom boot. How does that work out? There's a couple of companies that have been doing this for a long time. Again, these are 20-year-old, multi-generational companies, and they've been around pretty much forever. So companies like Catskill Moccasins or Son of Sandlar, and they're going to turn up pretty much at every major Ren Fair, you know, King Richards, Tuxedo, PA, Maryland. If it's in the sort of central through northeast on the Atlantic side, I know those. I'm not familiar with the stuff that's in the Midwest, but I'm sure there's people out there doing the same thing. And both those companies I named have been in existence, again, for well on to 20 years, if not, in fact, longer. There's generations of people in these boots. Now, the good side is, is they look incredible incredibly well fitted, they're custom fitted to you, and generally they have these lifetime guarantees because they are exorbitantly expensive. For a basic model of generally a custom boot, you're looking at something that to have someone else make it, mind you. We're talking, this is probably going to cost as much or more than your rent in an apartment. So that's an extreme level of investment at that point. That's the deep end of the pool. If you're doing that, you probably are in a position to say, well, you know what, I do multiple things. I go to a couple of Ren Fairs a year. I, I play more than five or six LARP games a year. Uh, I play multiple games. And, you know, maybe I also do the SCA, or, and I go to parties, and I just do other stuff, and whatever. So you're going to get, you want to get your use out of them if you're going to do that. And I don't think that's for everybody. That's on the deep end. But here we go back to that era of un, un, re, unreal resources, just incredible resources. I just noticed this the other week in the Tandy Leather catalog. And if you're not familiar with Tandy Leather, you should get familiar with them because they are an incredible resource for building armor and building kit and building out costumes. They are a wholesale leather retailer that is open to the public, and you can do a lot of great stuff with them. In the back of them, they started having all this stuff for basically LARPers. And I'd never seen that before now. Where they said, oh, cowboy cuffs. And you're looking at it, it's a bracer pattern. They're selling you the quality of leather and all the parts and the patterning to make your own bracers. And then what's beneath that? Something which would make all the Norwegians weep with joy. Boot patterns. You could make your own boots and they give you all the instructions and tell you what tools you need and it's not super expensive you might wind up with something that's a little closer to the minotons but it'll probably fit you better and if you wanted to you could even put your own sole on it so now all of a sudden you could have that tread you could do whatever colors you want you could buy leather dye and say well i don't want to just have something be sort of latigo color this cowhide tan let's go and add some crazy stuff in here and that's where real investment i think starts to come in 
is not when you're buying something, which no matter how high quality it is, but you're able to build it yourself. And you invest a lot of yourself into these projects, and then when you take that out, that shines through, especially as an NPC. It really shines through that you have a real emotional attachment to doing this thing. And maybe that NPC dies or goes away. I mean, that is the peril of LARPing. But how much will you inspire for having done it? I mean, how do you quantify that compound interest of your investment in terms of how many people will then create something amazing, which then that someone else says, I'm inspired to create something amazing, and it keeps passing it forward. I don't know that you can put a price on that. And given that there are games which are running 5, 10, 30 years... That could be a lot of really positive paying it forward. Just for going and saying, I want my NPCs to really set the bar of fashion above that of the players. And the players will then in turn respond to that, and it keeps getting better. And when new people show up and, you know, their LARP elders pull them aside and go, hey man, showing up in pajamas isn't the way we do things here you got to step your game up, and we'll, we'll help you with it. We're happy to show you how to do this. But you need to step your game up. And that starts in NPC camp. That starts in the game. And it finishes when players start really investing themselves into building, making, and maintaining their kits. So I'm going to post as many of the links as uh, I can to places to buy things and places that I've mentioned in this ramble. And hopefully this will get a few people thinking about, you know, maybe we can go and improve on our game and have more than just tabards and people in face masks and say, let's, let's go and see what we can do for minimal investment or get people to really sign on to make things a lot better. Because I don't think that's just the purview of Europe. I don't think that's something that only they do. And I'm starting to see games here do it where we have the ability to really, really impact the game as NPCs, persistent or not, just by setting the fashion bar that much higher. Thank you for watching.